so this uh, this is the paper I thought I'd go over. It's a precursor to the paper that we originally posted on designing effective sparse models. But that paper I thought was really confusing and uh, not terribly well written. And it sort of re relied on knowing this paper anyway. And I think this one is um, uh, well written. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and it's it's pretty relevant to the stuff we're doing. I think it even in the on the sparsity side, um, it, it's relevant, but it's definitely relevant to the dendrites uh, work. So I guess Kevin is here, um, so he can potentially. Uh, there's a bunch of sort of interesting performance improvements they do in here. Okay, so the title okay. is "Outrageously Large Neural Networks: Sparsely Gated Mixture of Experts Layer," um, and you know, when we're, whenever we do the dendrites work, people uh, always bring up, oh, is it just like a mixture of experts? And it kind of is like that, it kind of isn't. And I think this work is much more directly like a mixture of experts thing, but it's very uh, relevant. We can look, talk about the differences between this and our, and our dendrites work. Um, so yeah, so let's just go through it. Let's go through ab abstract. So, um, you know, they, they start off by mentioning something, you know, conditional computation where parts of the network are active on a per example basis has been proposed in theory as a way of dramatically increasing model capacity. So of course, this is very relevant to our sparsity work where conditional, if you don't do things, if you do things naively, naively conditional computation can occur and that sort of destroys the performance challenges and they sort of point that out here where there's in practice however there are significant algorithmic and performance challenges um, what they are doing here is well, they're saying that they address these challenges and finally realize the promise of conditional computation achieving greater than 1000x improvements in model capacity with only minor losses in efficiency of modern gpu clusters that's a pretty bold claim um, it's kind of true they do it, but there's some caveats. Um, but it's kind of interesting what they what they're doing. So what they do is they introduce a sparsely gated mixture of experts layer (MOE) consisting of up to thousands of feedforward subnetworks. And to do the way they do this is they're going to have a trainable gating network, which determines which sparse combination of experts we're going to use for every example on a per example basis. Now this should start sounding a lot like our dendrites uh, work. Um, so they apply it to mo language modeling and translation, blah, blah, blah. And they say they, they're showing up to 137 billion parameters. Now keep in mind, this was done five years ago. So that was pretty large back then. Uh, nowadays, this is not considered large. <laughs> um, so We'll go through the model and how they, and a little bit how they get these performance improvements. I didn't have time to go through the experiments at all. And I don't think the experiments are actually as interesting as the model itself and how it relates to our work. So this may be very different from most <laughs> machine learning uh, journal papers in that we're not gonna look at the experiments at all. I mean, you could just say, assume that because they're training much bigger models, they just get much better accuracies. And, on a bunch of different benchmarks. So that's kind of given, but it's sort of the model that's really uh, quite interesting. Um, so here uh, in the introduction, again, they say various forms of, uh, you know, here, conditional computation have been proposed as a way to increase model capacity. Um, and then they list a bunch of papers, which I actually wasn't aware of at all, and might be quite interesting for our, uh, related to our dendrites work. And basically, they say is in these in these schemes, large parts of a network are active or inactive on a per example basis. Um, so that sentence is true for our dendrites work as well. Although the way they these guys do it, I think, is quite different than the way we're doing it. And then they say the gating decisions can be binary or sparse or continuous, stochastic or deterministic. So there's all sorts of uh, variations on this. Um, so all of that makes it seem very interesting and relevant to the Denrights work. Oh, so oh, that, one, 
just a yeah. quick mark. Just looking at this reference, I know a few of these papers. Those are all the attention papers. Um, so I'm guessing they make uh, a strong uh, link with with attention. So where they... Yeah, they, in the model part, they don't talk about attention much at all, really. Because uh, um, those papers are all like the initial attention papers, so okay. like 2023 to 2015 and Joe and Benjo. I mean, yeah, those were the original ones. Okay, okay. So yeah, it might be useful to go back to some of those original ones as well, because uh, the way attention ended up is is somewhat different. But maybe in the beginning, it's very relevant to to that, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the words they're saying sound a lot like what we say for, for dendrites. One funny thing uh, I, I saw them do here is you look at the top, they have a bunch of authors and co-authors and uh, what they say here is these starred ones are equally major contributors. <laughs> I thought that was funny because usually you see like equal contribution or these authors contributed equally, but they want to put major in there. <laughs> they are not just equal, they're actually major contributors. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, okay. Maybe just another way to phrase that conditional computation thing might also be um, multiplicative interactions. There's that review paper, multiplicative interactions, and where to find them that went over transformers as well as other types of gating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so that might be like a review of some of these things. Um, I don't know. I mean, they are doing multiplicative. I don't know if it has to be multiplicative. Uh, you could imagine you know, other ways. So I guess here they're saying the gating decisions oops, could be binary. So that's, that sounds a little bit more like our HTM network. Okay, so um, I'll go back to the model picture in a second. Um, I think some of the stuff they say in the intro is, is interesting. Um, so you know, here they say modern computing devices, especially GPUs are much faster at arithmetic than at branching. So this is stuff that Kevin and, and Lawrence have talked about quite a bit. Um, and, and so the previous works, you know, try to turn on and off large chunks of the network with each uh, gating decision to avoid sort of fine grained branching. Um, at the same time on GPU, especially large batch sizes are critical for performance. Uh, but conditional comp computation reduces the batch size for the conditionally active chunks of the network. So this is very interesting uh, point. And they, this is the piece they actually say they solve in, in, this, in this paper. So if you think about our dendrites work for a given input, only let's say 2% or 5% of the network is actually processing that input, right? So most of, so if you have a batch of, you know, a, a thousand inputs for any given input, only 2% of it is actually being used. And so 98% of the batch is not being used. And so this is, um, this is an inefficiency that's, uh, that's showing up. And, and so you want to have large batch sizes, but conditional computation reduces the effective batch size. And so that's, you're kind of fighting against that with conditional computation. So that's, uh, they have a uh, solution to that here. We'll talk about uh, network bandwidth. Um, another interesting thing is um, here they they say loss terms may be necessary to achieve the desired level of sparsity per chunk or per example, and they'll talk a little bit about this here, um, and this can impact uh, model quality. So we'll we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. But their main motivation here is really performance, is really to improve the overall efficiency of these networks. And by, by doing that, they can greatly increase the size of the networks. So that's their motivation, which is a little different than, let's say what we're doing with dendrites where we're trying to avoid interference and we're applying it to continual learning and multitask learning and so on. So here their, their motivation is purely performance and increasing the sizes of, of these networks. Okay, so what they're doing is, um, oh, okay, maybe this is with the related work, I highlighted this piece that may be, may be interesting. Um, so in Eigen et al, 2013, that's a great name for a 
researcher. <laughs> um, they introduced the idea of using multiple mixture of, mixture of experts with their own gating networks as parts of a deep model. And here, the mixture of experts is the whole model. So what they're doing is here, I'm guessing, is that it's a well, what they're saying is a top level mixture of experts. So you have, you know, let's say 100 completely separate networks. And at the very top, they do a, an, a sum or a weighted sum of the mixtures uh, to get the actual output. So that's more like a typical mixture of experts. Um, oh, that, oh, I'm sorry, that's these works above. What Eigen et al. do is they use mixture of experts as parts of a, as part, a gating network within a deep model. So you have mixtures of experts inside a deep model. And so they say it is intuitive that the latter approach is more powerful since complex problems may contain many subproblems, each requiring different experts. And I highlighted that because that's one of the core motivations with our Den Rights work as well. Um, so rather than having one mixture of experts at the top, we kind of have you know, these mixtures of subnetworks, if you will, or different subnetworks for that are very dependent on the on the context. And they're also saying it's intuitive that this is more powerful. I would say our Den Rights stuff adds another level of power on top of what they're doing here because. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit because there, there's is more like having one dendrite uh, per per neuron. Okay, so what are they doing? Uh, they introduce a mixture of experts layer, a very similar to how we ex introduced a dendrites layer. They're introducing a mixture of experts layer here. Um, so the mixture of experts layer consists of a set of expert n expert networks and a gating network whose output is an n-dimensional vector. And then the simple form is this thing here where they do a, a element-wise multiplication of the output of the gating network multiplied by the output of each of the expert networks. Okay. Um, and then typically this, this G here would not be sparse, but what they mention is that if G is sparse, then whenever G is zero, we can you can skip computing that that expert completely. Okay, so if you have a thousand experts and only you know twenty of them are are going to be on or not have non-zero G's, then you can skip nine hundred and eighty of them and just compute twenty of them. Okay, so that's kind of what they saying at the. Next thing here, in our experiments, we have up to thousands of experts, but we only need to evaluate a handful of them on every, for every expert. Uh, and then they talk about having a hierarchical mixture of experts, which basically means you have multiple layers. So I'm not really gonna go into that, but it's just layers of these mixture of experts things. But you can understand everything by thinking of a single layer. Um, so to introduce, so what is this G? So it all boils down to what is this gating function, gating network doing? And so what they do is, um, so the first intuition is they're saying, okay, well, a simple choice of a gating function, which is non-sparse would be to use softmax. So you take the input here, multiply it by some weights, do a softmax of it, and that can be your gating function. Okay, so now you'll get numbers between zero and one where a few of them will have high values um, and it's sort of modeling probabilistically you know, the, the, the contribution of, of each expert. So, but G, if you use max, it's not gonna be sparse. So what did they do? They add a noisy top K winner take all. <laughs> so they add two different things. They add a sparsity component and a noise component. Um, so, so basically what they're doing is if you look at this X times WG, so they do take the input multiplied by this gating weight matrix. Then they have a weight matrix for the noise values. So they multiply the input by another weight matrix. They do a soft plus of this. And I didn't really, I, I didn't look this up. What is, what is a soft plus exactly? I think there's no like, it's like a curved around zero, right? 
Um, Lucas, am I wrong in that? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm looking up. I don't remember to be honest. Um, I remember. It, I remember yeah. it, like it's not like a, a hard constraint around one of the numbers. I forgot which one it is. Yeah, you're right. I thought it was like, like Relu, but yeah, it's, it tails off smoothly around zero. Around zero, it goes like all the way to minus five. It goes up like slowly, decreases yeah. all, yeah, all the way to minus five. It goes to <laughs> minus five. Did yeah, but uh, yeah, after zero, it, it doesn't stop at zero. It, there is some residual value here, and then it decreases slowly uh, all the way to minus five. So yeah, it's sort of a ReLU, but like a soft ReLU. Okay, so it would go sort of like like this, and then sort of slowly go. No, no, it's all above the zero uh, y-axis. So I. I oh, uh, oh, okay. So you mean it's something like this? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then from this point on, it's zero. Yeah. And for some reason, there's a magic minus five here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is an ex. It's not a linear. It's in like an exponential. It is an exponential. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's the soft. Okay. Oh, but is there competition? Like softmax, there's competition across the different units. This, this thing suggests no. It's just looking at it unit by unit. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Okay, so it's, I'm just kind of curious. If, I'm sorry. I, I'm just kind of curious if that minus five, if that's in the way that they they're implementing this thing, is that like number of standard deviations or not? Uh, I, don't <laughs> I don't know. You gotta look at the formula. But just for your uh, remarks, of that, so that h of x is inside top k so after you do that you are doing top k oh yeah yeah i'll get to the top k part in a second i'm okay. just thinking of this so far it's they call it soft plus but there's no competition at at this point um, across the different x i can think of it just as a softer value yeah yeah exactly. okay the formula for this is um log of one plus the exponent of x okay okay so plus one. Um, okay, and then there's the and they so they so essentially they do like a soft ReLU of the input, and then they multiply it by, uh, you know, a, a Gaussian. Um, and then they add that to this to this value, so that's their their noise term. Uh, so this is their noise term. So they add that, and then, um, as you were saying, they take they take the top k of that whole thing, and then they pass it through a soft max. Um, so this will, I guess, guarantee that there's um, you know k of k non zero values that the g will have. Um, I'm not sure why exactly. You know, you could use yeah. Okay. Well, I guess uh, similar to our case, you you need actual zeros here to skip the computation. So that's why they have the the k winner take all. You know, why I think they use a soft plus because it's um, it always return positive values, and then they multiply by standard normal, which mm -hmm. go from minus to plus. So you don't want. I think they don't want the case where you have a negative values on both sides. This right, 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 right. This is more tractable. Okay. Yeah, that's probably why. Yeah, that makes sense. And their keep top k is ex you know exactly our winner take all. Oh no, minus infinity. Otherwise, okay. They need the minus infinity to make sure the soft max is zero at that point. I mean, they could have just done soft max and then keep top k and just use a regular k winner take all. I'm not sure you the order matters that much. Okay, so, um, and then they train the whole thing with that prop. Um, so this is kind of their, their model. And I kind of drew a little diagram of it um, to help us think about this versus the dendrites layer. So this is the sparse mixture of experts layer. So you get the input coming in. Um, I wish there was like a pointer here. Oh, there is. Oh. Okay. Oh, 
Interesting. So when I'm sharing this pointer thing shows up, that's pretty cool. Okay, so there's, um, yeah, the input and it, this is the feed forward portion uh, of the network. So this is just a standard uh, network, except here, what I'm doing, I should have drawn these in squares. These, each of these are different experts. So they're not necessarily individual units. These could be actual full uh, networks. So they're going, so you have the feed forward input going through there. Um, you know, part of the input goes through here and, and through that noise function. That noise thing gets added to a linear weighted sum of the input here. Then they take a K winner take all here, um, then through the softmax, and then that output is multiplied against the output of the of the mixtures, and then you get the final output. Okay. So again, here most of these values will be zero, only k of them will be non-zero. And so coming out of here, you only get k non-zero things. So I drew it this way. Um, a similar, uh, they kind of, this is also an interesting way to, to draw it here is you have an input coming in in a gating network, which is that whole thing on the left, that blue thing that I showed. The difference here is that they have an arrow that goes from the gating network to the feed forward. And the reason for this is if anything is zero from the gating network, uh, you can completely skip those experts. So in this example, only to the, the out of the gating vector that's coming out, uh, only position two and position n minus one have non-zero values. Everything else is zero. So as they're showing here, you only need to send the input to these two experts, only need to compute those two, and then do the, uh, do the multiplication. And I guess I'd forgotten this in my diagram, but then they add everything together before you get the final output. So this is like a standard expert system thing. I forgot to put that in my diagram. So this is something we do not do. We don't add everything together. So if you look at... Do, do they um, talk about like why, why softmax and not some other function like sigmoid? Because softmax, you're gonna attribute like high value to just a fuel of endurance and you're not only making it sparse, but you're really concentrating on just a few of the units. Yeah. That, is that like a requirement for the system or? They didn't really mention that. They just said it's a natural choice. A natural choice, okay. <laughs> Probably missing <laughs> something. Like oh no, they said it's a simple choice. Oh, okay. A simple choice of now. Because um, yeah, the, the natural choice for us was just a sigmoid, right? So <laughs> that's what we chose. Yeah, uh, you know what they're doing here. So the softmax will keep a have a lot of values, a few values near one, right? Yeah, and then everything else will be near zeros. Um, what they could do is, you know, quite commonly in a mixture of experts, they could add a weight value for each expert here, and then this could literally be zero one at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so there, I think there are a lot of variations and choices here that could be explored. Okay. Yeah. And same with our dendrites thing. So, uh, so this I'm contrasting their network, my drawing of their network with what we're doing here is um, very similar. It's just things are sort of flipped a little bit. Um, as you guys know, uh, we have the feed forward component and the input goes to, Okay, so here, suppose we have one dendrite per unit. We can put the dendrites out here. Okay, each of these are units now, not networks. So we have one dendritic segment per unit here. Um, you know, we do a linear weighted sum of the input, pass it through a sigmoid, and then that's multiplied by the value of these things. And we do a K winner take all afterwards. So I'm not sure there's a, so we're not adding noise. So that's a big difference. Other than that, I'm not sure there's a huge difference between this. You know, as I, um, oops. You know, I should draw this some. I'm, I'm assuming in their care winner at all, they don't do anything like boosting. And I think boosting might serve the same purpose as their addition of the noise, at least during training. Does that make sense? Okay. 
I'll get to that in a second. That's a very good question. Well, uh, they do mention issues with their K winner take all. Um, so I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but yeah, so other than that big plus at the end, you know, I think the biggest difference here is that each expert is thought of as a whole network. So each of these is in here. Um, I should have really drawn these as squares because they're they, they're thought of as entire networks. In fact, it's important that they be full networks. Um, and why is that? Uh, you can see here. Um, so the way they get computational savings is, um, you know, there's, let's see, you know, they're kind of they're skipping the computation of these guys, but they're still doing the gating network. So they're incurring the cost of the gating network, but they're saving the cost of the different experts. So that only helps if the experts are much more costly than the gating network. In our case, a single dendrite is the same cost as a single unit, right? There's no, uh, so in our system, we wouldn't, if we use this scheme to save computation, we wouldn't save any computation. It, it only makes sense if these experts are much heavier computationally than, than the gating network itself. Does that make sense? So I think that's kind of the, one of the biggest differences is they really expect these to be big networks. Um, and it really is a mixture of experts in the sense that they're um, you know, adding everything up at the, before they send the, the outputs up. Well, just one, one thing that I didn't get it. So in order to save computation, I'm assuming you compute the blue path before. So you yeah. already know which experts you're gonna need or not. And then you compute the, the, the black path. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's what this thing shows here. Okay. So they're doing the, yeah, oh, they're doing okay. this. The, the yeah, yeah, they're doing the gating piece first. Okay. Then this arrow here shows the switch thing. This arrow is what's selecting which experts are actually going to get this data and compute. Okay. Right. Okay. So if you know if if statements were free, conditionals were free. First of all, Kevin wouldn't have a job. Second of all. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, um, if they were free, then then this this would save tons of computation by doing the gating network first. But again, it relies on the fact that expert these experts are much heavier than the gating networks. Uh, and it allows them to also scale because when you're looking at uh, at uh, clusters of nodes, uh, computational nodes, if you can if you do a coarse hack at the thing. Uh, you rather than at, at the at the fine grain level, uh, it, it, you can see how it can be just more efficient to say, okay, we only send a few of these uh, uh, models. Uh, we activate only a few of these models at a time, and we distribute them all across all these nodes. So at a you know when you go to scale in this thing, uh, it, it it's a lot easier to kind of manage it because you essentially put the conditionals in, in an outer outer loop. Did you read the paper already? Uh, no. Okay. Well, that's exactly their system, I think. Um, so I think you're you're you hit on exactly what how they're going to scale this. Well, very close to what you just said is how they're going to uh, scale the system. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's get to that. Um, okay. So what they're doing. Um, so first of all, the the problem that we alluded to earlier is this uh, shrinking uh, here, shrinking batch problem. So what happens is that uh, you need to have large batch sizes to get computational efficiency. And typically what you do is um, you would have a you know, copy of the network. Well, let's say you have a single, single uh, GPU. You have the copy of the network there. Um, if the gating network chooses K out of N experts for each example, so let's say out of a thousand experts is choosing, let's say 2% or 20 at a time. Then for a batch of B examples, each expert is receives a much smaller batch of approximately this many examples, right? So they're only getting 2% of the examples on average. And this is gonna be you know, much smaller than the actual number of, of examples. 
Um, and so most of the time, these experts are sitting idle um, for any given thing. And it's really hard to, as you, it's really hard to increase the batch size because you're gonna run out of memory, even though, um, you know, if you think about, here's a batch, um, you know, on this batch, only this guy and this guy is being, let's say only K equals two, only these two are actually being computed. Here, only these two are actually being used, and here, only these two are actually being used. But you're using up the memory for all of these, for everything, uh, even though only a tiny piece of this is actually being used, uh, useful, uh, for, uh, used for computation. And so this becomes very, very inefficient. The, and the, the larger the number of experts, um, the more inefficient it gets. Um, you know, so you can try to increase the original batch size, but then you're limited by memory. You can't just, you just can't store everything. So what they're doing is basically something and very similar, I think, to what you just said, Kevin, um, is that imagine now you can, if you, oh, the other thing is, even if you're doing the typical distributed, you know, PyTorch distributed thing, what will happen, you'll still get this problem because you're having a separate copy of the network on each GPU. Uh, but within that copy, you still have exactly the same, same problem. So instead, what they're doing is they're doing a combination of data parallelism and model parallelism. And um, let's see if I can do it here. So imagine in the, in the, you have a bunch of different GPUs. Um, you have, let's say one GPU per expert. And so this one is going to get expert one, this one's gonna get expert two, this one's gonna get expert three, this one's gonna get expert four, okay? And now what you do is you, you have this outer loop conditional and you only send in the data here that's gonna be relevant for expert one. So you have some outer loop, um, I don't know what they uh, would call, you know, you have your, your gating network and you, you know, you have your inputs coming in and you're going to somehow collect in, collect a bunch of samples. You're only going to send in, um, okay, so the way, yeah. So let's say um, expert one is going to look at batch, you know, example, number one, example number five, example number seven. It's gonna not need anything else. So what you would send in here would be example one, example five, and example seven, okay? So this, so this GPU is being fully utilized and this expert is gonna be fully busy processing this guy. Um, and, you know, over here, you might send in, you know, example two, example, I don't know, six, example nine. So ex expert two is gonna be fully utilized, okay? So now if you have a thousand experts, you can make your bats and your bat size effectively 50, you know, let's say you're using 2% um, density. Now you can make your batch sizes 50 times bigger. Was that, did that make sense? Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Okay, so by scaling, so the question, yeah, I have one question. So if the gating network says I've got nothing of use to give to expert number two or three, do they remain idle, or do they just say I'm just going to divvy the the, the batches up and they all get a crack at something? Um, that is that's a good they, question. Um. Can they predict which experts are going to be relevant given something, some metric that they evaluate the gating point? I'm yeah, wondering if so that's they, where the noise comes in. Is that like by just you know having random noise, you on average get to distribute the load across GPUs? Yeah, they do mention that the noise helps in this load balancing. This is still an issue for them. Um, see if we can. Uh, yeah, so th this says this technique allows us to increase the number of experts by increasing the number of devices 
So you can now have really massive batches. Um, <laughs> they say, it is our goal to train a trillion parameter model on a trillion word corpus. We have not scaled our systems this far, but it should be possible by adding more hardware. <laughs> um, and as, as we know, Google has done a trillion parameter model at this point. And so I think, and I believe they're using this technique to do it, if I remember correctly. Um, Sorry, just to make sure in a sense so the experts are not using the same data that they're receiving different pieces, different sub batches of the batch. Is that? Y yes, uh, but it's, 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 uh, it's computationally identical to what's going on here. Right. So in this case, for example, for this particular input shown in this example, um, you know, only expert two and expert n minus one are going to actually compute it. Uh, is, so is the way to think of this, like there's like a global batch size of say a thousand, but that breaks down into batches of size, say 50 for each expert and then each expert gets its own, you know, 50 example batch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so Lucas, uh, I don't know if that was clear or not, but it's, uh, if, if this is the batch again on the, on the right, um, for a given input, only this expert and this expert is gonna process it. Everything else is gonna be zero. If K equals two, everything else is gonna be zero. So, there's no point sending you know, this expert, this data point, because it's not gonna uh, compute it. So instead what they will do is, um, if, you, if you look at this example, what expert, yeah, let's say this is you know, expert one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's say there are six experts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the data that's gonna be sent to, um, yeah, and let's say this is X1, X2, X, oops, X3, and so on, right? The data that's gonna be sent to expert one is gonna be only X3. Um, you know, let's say it, it also, expert one also happened to do this other one you know, XI, um, sorry, my colors. <laughs> so it also gets sent XI. So it gets sent those two only. Whereas expert two is gonna get um, sent X1. And if it also, expert two also won for XI, then it would also get XI coming in. So if everything is perfectly balanced, then every expert is gonna get, in this case, exactly two of them, right? And so now, mm -hmm. and, and, and now each GPU is fully busy processing each one, right? So it would only take the equivalent of two compute speed forward cycles uh, to compute the entire thing. But the actual batch size you have is much bigger than this too. Okay, and then Does that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, but we are talking about training all this time, right? This could. Uh, this is the, this is training and inference. Um, this can be used for both. Wait, but I'm missing something here. If, if different... oh, oh, but yeah, well, the batch sizes, I guess, for inference. No, if I mean, if your inference is in batches, you can use this too. Well, but if they are looking at different data well they're looking at different data essentially right or i'm, I'm misunderstanding something here well okay no what would happen if you didn't do this uh you would get past x1 everything would get x1 right you'd pass it through the gating network the gating network says only expert two and five need to process it so there's no point having you know experts uh one, three, four, and six, you know, process this batch, right? And so mm -hmm. what'll happen is if, if this entire network is on a single GPU, most of the 
GPU will be idle and it's only going to be processing this and this. Right. Right. Or it could process everything, but it's not going to be used. So right. it's just wasted computation. Right. So, so instead, um, you only need to send X1 to expert two. Right. So you only send, send it to expert two. So, so, so the game so that X1 was here basically... is a full vector. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, this is like an, let's think about ImageNet. This X1 is a full image. And what this matrix says is just which expert is going to look at each image. So if you look at image number one, only expert two and five are going to process it. So yeah. why, why, why do you need to send it to expert one at all? Okay. So I see your point now. Thanks. So it's, a, it's an interesting, it's sort of what Kevin was saying earlier, I think, probably more compactly than I just said it. But um, it's, uh, it's a cool idea. Yeah. Um, and so by doing this, they ex basically, um, so the model is distributed over D devices, um, they can get a factor of D improvement in here. In the, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm showing the extreme where every expert is on a completely separate GPU, but it, it doesn't have to be that way. But the most efficient case is when every expert is on a separate GPU. Uh, so going back to some of the other questions. Um, so this is what uh, Kevin, you were asking about and also uh, um, Ben uh, you're mentioning. So wh what's interesting is, so they have observed that the gating network, which includes a K winner type all, tends to converge to a state where it always produces large weights for the same few experts. This imbalance is self-reinforcing as the favored experts are trained more rapidly and thus selected even more by the gating network. So this is exactly the problem we have in our K winner take all without boosting, right? Um, so this will make it make these batches very imbalanced, right? And so what they do is they have something almost identical to our, not identical, it's the same idea. Same, the spirit of the idea is the same, but they do it as a loss function. So they basically um, compute the importance of each expert by looking at the sum of the gating values um, across, across the batch. And so if the gating value for expert one is really high, that means expert one is being chosen all the time. I'm sorry, if the importance is, yeah, if the expert value for the gating, and the gating value for expert one is constantly high. Importance will be high for that expert. Uh, that means that expert is being is winning, winning a lot, and it's being chosen uh, quite a lot. And so, what you want to do is you want to spread out the importance thing so they're as equal as possible. Right? If every if every gating value gating, I'm sorry, if every expert had the same gating value sum of gating values, that means that everyone's being chosen approximately equally. And so uh, they try to minimize the variance of this importance vector. Um, and they have a weight. So they try to, this, this becomes the part of the loss function. And this is like our boost factor is just how much do you weight this particular term in the loss function? Uh, just sorry, what, to what dwell does CV stand for here? I'm sorry? What, what does CV stand for here? Uh, covariance, uh, coefficient oh, yeah, of variance. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Coefficient of variance. Coefficient of variance, or is it a? It's not a covariance matrix, I think. It's okay, just, so um, it's coefficient of variance, meaning the standard deviation divided by the mean? It's the I guess so, yeah. Wait, yeah, 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 okay, I'm sorry. That's what I was gonna ask about too, Kevin. And so it's a little weird that they're squaring it because the coefficient of variation is technically just the square root of the Fano factor. <laughs> so they could have also just written Fano factor of the importance. Mm. But it's, a little, it's, a, it's actually a little weird to break down what that means for a sum. I guess if you think of each X as being a separate sample, you can... 
Oh, I, th I think they're doing it for, this is for one batch. So they're doing this across batches. So they get one of these for each batch. So they're doing a batch wise sum. So they get yeah. one of these for each batch and then across batches, they're doing the variation, the, the coefficient of variation. Okay, uh, I think that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the pieces that they use to load. Um, they still get, even with this, uh, they still get experts, which get different numbers of examples. Um, they have a second loss function, which I didn't look at. Um, we, can, we can look at that if you want together, but which ensures balance loads. But at the end of the day, I think, they might just, oh, well, I guess we can look at that right now. Yeah, I didn't go through this in detail, but then your intuition is right. This is where the noise comes in. Um, so the, um, yeah, they want to, they want to uh, learn noise values and I think such that the load is is really balanced and you can't um, since the number of examples received by an expert is a discrete quantity it cannot be back propagated instead they have an estimator of load um, and I didn't quite read through this I, I had to go to the dentist I read that <laughs> it, anyway, they, it looked like some of the choices that they that they made in there like you know uh, you know Putting minus infinities in uh, in in early outputs, it, it was it was like they were they were trying to how, how to say this? well the minus trying infinity to make it easier sense. for back propagation to work. It, it's like they're trying to go, they're saying can we make this thing as some uh, as gradient friendly as possible? Is if that makes sense? Well, I think the minus infinity was there. Uh, to ensure that the softmax is zero for that value. Otherwise it'd be non-zero. Right, they were, the fact if, that they have a continuous function of softmax is, is what I'm trying to say. I mean, you were, you were speculating so whether they could function. have just gone with the K winners period and not you know gone through this ledger domain. Well, this is not a continuous function. Um, uh, I mean, this is the same as our K winner take all. We just have zero here instead. Um, okay. And they even mentioned that, uh, you know, while this form of sparsity creates some theoretically scary discontinuities <laughs> in the output, we have not yet observed this to be a problem in practice. Okay. Uh, and then, All right. yeah, and then this noise term helps with load balancing as we, we just discussed. So I think they okay. could have put the, you know, they could have put the softmax inside and just used RK winner take all on the outside. In this case, that would be just zero. Okay, I, I was just thinking they were being squeamish about having discontinuous functions there, but I guess they backed into it. Well, they are way. squeamish, but they say it works. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I think they could have written this as K winner take all, you know, soft max of H of X, comma K. They could have done that and then just used our regular K winner take all with regular boosting. I mean, well, but, we could, I'm saying we could implement it this way. Well, but if, if you're doing like that, is there even a point of using a softmax inside? I mean, a softmax is costly. Yeah, I think what the softmax does is it keeps the numbers between zero and one for the multiplication. Right, but, but I think there are cheaper ways of keeping the numbers between yeah, zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we use a sigmoid. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why that, that's a good point because softmax is also a competitive thing, right? Yeah, right. and top K is also a competitive thing. So you don't need that. Um, you know, could you just, you know, do kind of like what we do and just use a sigmoid here? That might be just fine. Yeah, another thing I was thinking about uh, in the light of what you just explained, they're trying to save computation. If you're using a soft max, especially if it's like a low temperature soft max, a lot of those networks are gonna be attributed like a very, very low value. Is there even a point of including them in the computation or do they use like some sort of cutoff if it's like below a threshold? 
that's just that's just the nature of softmax so anything that's not going to be minus infinity it's going to be attributed like some value i'll be yeah part of the are going to be a very small value yeah i don't think they do anything special there because they're keeping k very small so only k of these elements are going to have non-zero values so how, how small is k then well, I didn't read through the experiments. We can look at that now. Um, okay, so I'm reading this as, as we go. Okay, so here, um, yeah, they say they're going, the, the models with mixture of experts going from four to 256 and four at a time are active. So K is four. Oh, that's very small. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Okay. laughs> but keep in mind, each expert is like a full-on network, right? So even doing two of them is more powerful. Is, is fairly powerful. Right. It's a little different from our dendrites in this, where everything's a unit. Um, but the nice thing is now you can you can have these much 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 bigger networks. Um, because you have so many more experts, but you can still be very efficient in how you process each batch. That's sort of the really big benefit of this. Um, yeah, so here they're showing how the, not having read this is showing how the perplexity of the error decreases as a function of the number of parameters. So the more and more experts you add, the more you can get. And I did not really look into the hierarchical MOAs, but this there you can get more of these experts running. Each expert had about 1 million parameters. Okay, so these experts are much, much bigger than the single unit. Um, and here, what they're showing is that if you, for a fixed computational budget, um, the mixture of experts does quite a bit better in perplexity. But of course, these models are much bigger than this, these models. So uh, you. Lucas, you'll be, uh, you'll be annoyed they didn't do a A to B parameters comparison. <laughs> they did not say <laughs> if you have a mixture of experts models with p parameters and an LSTM model with the same p parameters, they didn't do that comparison as far as I can tell. I, maybe they did. I was thinking here, it's interesting. This is a mixture of experts of transformers, and each, each of them is already composed of several heads. Uh, I wonder if you could just do that in the heads instead if you sort like the k winners if you just have a lot of heads mm -hmm. and then you put some k winners there before the soft max if you could kind of replicate the same idea well yeah that gets closer to how we might try to use something like dendrites instead of attention right. you know we can start to think about uh, things like that but yeah i think it's a good idea to try to see if we can treat each attention head as an expert in some sense yeah. I'm pretty sure there's also different types of attention. Like there's um there's like hard attention, which means like it's basically like K winners take all. Like you set the attention weights to zero for all but a subset. So there's like mm. several scales at which <laughs> K winners can operate. Yeah, and I wonder if that's what they're doing with this hierarchical. What are they doing? Oh, so it's a two-level. Yeah, I guess it's just a mixture of a mixture of experts. So you can save even more compute. It, it's probably a, a routing issue is that, you know, if, if you have to go, you know, one to, you know, between one and a million, but it's easier if you do it, you know, one to a thousand than uh, another layer of one to a thousand. So um, it's, it you can, you can distribute you know, you can kind of do this, you know, I move stuff to the first level of the hierarchy and then fan it out from there. So you're, you're not shoveling from one node, a massive number of, of batches, you know, and then uh, uh, 
trying to source from just one single node out to say, you know, a million instances of, of, of GPUs, you know, to be yeah. kind of gross about that. So I think just from a pure uh, information routing point of view, it makes sense to uh, divide and conquer in that fashion. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, they mention, you know, network bandwidth in here. Um, Yeah, so they're, yeah, they're like I said, the ratio of a computing capacity is a thousand to one. So, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I just guessed that number. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. One question I had is yeah. whether they're able to, um, when they when they finally trained the thing and they had their, you know. Were they able to come up with the fact that, yeah, you know, uh, we've been able to identify simply, you know, these, you know, 500 problem domains, and for each one of those domains, there's always this cluster of four that we, that we pick, and and they're somewhat similar. If I'm looking at sentences, uh, I'm looking at, you know, active voice. Or, I mean, did they try to say was did did the network semantically do some interesting sorting when they got finished with it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't know that I did that analysis. I, I didn't actually read through their experiments. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, but it looks like they're just focused on accuracy. I they mean, might have done that with the multilingual thing, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, they might have done that internally. Um, but I think here they are just focused on accuracies. Okay. okay. Yeah, but if you're, you know, if, um, if you're doing French and Spanish, for example, there might be enough similarity that you might have a subset of the experts focused on that, whereas Korean would be a completely different set of experts. Yeah, I mean, you know, Romance languages, you know, versus, yeah. you know, a, uh, Asian. Uh, yeah, it's a gross kind. Yeah. <laughs> and English may have a combination of German and you know, Latin, Romance languages or something. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Germanic and, uh, and yeah. So, so for the training of the gate networks, there were some weights in there. How did they train the gate network? So the entire thing is just trained using standard backprop. Um, so in parallel, the gate and the exports are trained. Yeah. So here, they train the gating network by simple backprop. So this is the you know, same thing we're doing with Dendrite. Okay. Did you see a, a parallel of, of this with um, with the brain? I mean, it's, it's not a far-fetched question, but in Dendrites, you're not really like saving computation away. You're just deciding whether the unit or not is going to be active. And yeah. in this case, you know beforehand whether you need this whole region of the network, like this whole sub network, and then you decide whether or not you're going to pass the input through that. Do you see any parallels with the brain? Yeah. Uh, well, but well, Ben put on the chat that this is a little bit. You can think of each expert maybe like a cortical column, um, and processing stuff in parallel. So you can maybe think of it, I think it's a little bit different because each cortical column will get a different subset of the input itself. So different visual cortical columns will process different parts of the visual field. Um, but there is routing going on and there is, you know, we, have, we think there's voting going on and stuff like that. So there is some potential parallel. Yeah, but- um, I, I don't think we get the same, I don't think we have, a situation in the brain where you have multiple networks that are processing the identical input and then they're just summed like a true mixture of experts. I think the situation is more like what we have in the dendrites where you select some, you have this big large network and you select subsets of that, distributed subsets of that, you know, at every level of the, of the processing. Okay. There, there yeah, are, so, I mean, I there's lower... this, at a, at a very, very high level, there might be relationships, but I think that when you go to the details, this is a little bit different. 
Uh, if I could just follow up on that briefly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with both you guys. Um, like the key difference seems to be that they're parallelizing uh, over entire examples instead of subsets of mm -hmm. the same example. But one reason for that might be that the brain operates in an online setting. So there's really no such thing as batching in the brain. But if you're in the offline setting, then you could use kind of the same architecture to construct these batches and save computation. So to yeah. me, the principle of parallelization that the brain is using is similar, but just the environment in which it's deployed is different. Right. Well, but okay, let, let's think of the case even that each color column has different examples, not the same, but deciding whether or not a caracal column is gonna be activated means that we are talking about like dendrites of a column, which is not a thing, right? It's, I, I'm having a hard time drawing a parallel, even if we think of each expert as a caracal column, Yeah, I guess that's true. You never like turn on and off an entire cortical column. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the voting. Well, but but maybe you sort of do. Like maybe if a if a single cortical column is just like not getting any sensory input, the firing rate in that column is probably just going to be a lot lower than if it is. Right, but, but then you're filtering based on the input, not filtering based on like some pre-computation that tells whether or not you should use that column. Yeah, so there, there's stuff like, um, so there's attention, you know, so there's covert attention, which might focus the computation on a, some subset of the cortical columns and tell the other cortical columns to sort of ignore it. Um, so you could, oh, you could think of this as somewhat, similar to biological covert attention. Um, so, so in that case, like the, the thalamus would have this small network that do the gating and then- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that could be, <laughs> oh, that's an interesting, yeah. So this could be like the thalamus, right? Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I can see that now. In fact, the architecture does look a lot like It looks sort of similar to this. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea that going back to that multiple scales of sparsity idea, dendrites kind of give you sparsity at the level of individual neurons. Maybe the thalamus gives you sparsity at the level of cortical columns. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's um, it's never a case. It, it, Okay, uh, it is a little bit different though. Um, if it's attention, what we think is going on is that the brain is saying, I'm expecting some input here. So it's, there's a, you know, some area of the visual field, let's say, where you are expecting input. And so you're, you're predicting input there and then you process it. But it's not like input elsewhere is ignored completely. So it is diminished. So, uh, but if something really, something happens outside of the focus of attention, it can actually draw your attention to that, right? That'll be a surprise. Um, and so it's not exactly this way. Um, there's, you know, expert one, three and N here are not like sitting idle. They are still, they may be processing less or maybe they're diminished in some way, but if something, dramatic happens there, they will notice it and, you know, it'll be, so I think it's, it's hard to draw too many analogies to the brain here. It, it, and the brain, kind of like Lucas was saying, it's, or Ben, you were saying, it's not a batch system. It's really, we're streaming and we're embodied, we're doing, <laughs> we're, you know, acting in the world and it, it's a very, it, it's hard to draw too many analogies here, I think. Yeah, I mean, this, this network, if it's given something new, it gets perplexed. It doesn't know what to do about it. Whereas surprise yeah. says that you can harness something to do something about that. Yeah, yeah. So this is very passive in comparison. Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah but just a, a disagree with one point that's not fully batching because you can even see online as batching if you look at like over the time dimension. 
you, you're getting, I don't know, like 100 inputs in a second, and you could see that as a batch because there is a limit of how much energy uh, you can dedicate, how much units you can actually activate without like going uh, overheating. So that is a batch in a way. I, I, I don't know about that. I, I think I need a deeper explanation to buy that the brain is doing time batching. Yeah, no, because if, if you look, if you look at silicon, right, and if it's a temporal batch, you don't have that sort of energy threshold. You can just process all of them, but the brain can't, right? You have that limit of how much energy you can spend in a given like minute or whatever, how many units you can activate. So sure. in a way, it is a batch that uh, the temporal dimension could be thought as a batch. I, I still don't follow. I completely buy the idea that the brain has to be and is efficient. I don't quite see how, I, I, don't, I just don't get the temporal dimension batching thing. Yeah, my, my point is maybe, um, okay, and then I, I'm just like going over the board, <laughs> just theorizing, but <laughs> my, my point here is that maybe you receive inputs in a greater frequency then you can actually process them, right? So let's work with this. Okay. So you receive like 100 different inputs in a minute, but you can only process 10 of them in a minute. So you got to choose. Um, so, in the, so like cortical column can't process 100, can only process 10. So in that way, it becomes sort of a batch. So you, you will have to distribute that somehow because now it can't process all 100 inputs in a minute. I would just call that subsampling instead of batching. Like you're sampling something that's at 100 hertz. You're just only taking 10 samples from it. No, you can use all of them. You're just distributing. You're doing like data parallelism. Oh, but yeah, but the, I don't. What's what's the evidence that the brain is saving up copies of like 100 sensory inputs in a row and then divvying them out? I. I, I don't know. I'm just raising up. <laughs> here. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm not trying to be mean about it. I, just, I have uh, well, <laughs> one, well, maybe one, maybe one way to think of it is, uh, you know, if you think about machine learning, you have a whole batch of learning. Uh, bat, you do multiple forward passes through a batch, and then you do one learning step, right? Mm -hmm. So the the rate at which you learn is dependent on the batch size. Um, in the brain, you're learning on every input that's coming in, but there are also much slower forms of learning too. So, you know, the extreme one is, you know, overnight you consolidate memories and the next day you learn, you know, you've, look, you, you've learned uh, a bunch of stuff. And so you could think of, there's some abstract batch of the entire day of experience that somehow stored somewhere in your brain that you consolidate overnight and learn from. So it's, Nothing is as in the brain is as hard as fast as in, in machine learning. But the, if you think of batching as, as related to the time scale of learning, uh, you, you could imagine there's you know, something like a rough batch being saved in the brain. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with your point on like the experience replay thing, but I was more of questioning, is it true that if can a cortical column process all the inputs it gets? Uh, sequentially, or isn't there like some sort of energy threshold, how much energy you can spend? Uh, I don't what know if it's, it, uh, it's there just is at any energy. point in time, at any point in time, that's what the sparsity does. It, it controls how much energy is being devoted at any point in time. So there is, there is control over energy. There's also just the time <laughs> constant of neurons. So neurons can only respond to their sensory inputs so fast. And you know, a typical neuron has a membrane time constant of say 20 milliseconds. So you're already windowing over time. And that's why I would say it's subsampling instead of, uh, of batching. But the point that it's being uh, economical with its energy expenditure in multiple ways, I still agree with. I see, I see, I see. I think the main point is is that if if you say you can't process, you know, you can only process ten out of a hundred, you either winnow it down or you have to buffer it, and then you have to propose a buffering mechanism that allows it to re-examine that, you know, whether it's recirculant on something. So you start having adding memory in there in order to consider the whole thing as a batch. 
And I, I think that's where the discontinuity is. Do we have a mechanism for actually doing it in the brain? Or as Ben says, it's simply winnowing things down uh, based upon you know some criteria. But is it different though? Like let's say I have 10 columns associated with one patch, right? And then I get the first sensory sent to one color column, then I get the second, but the first color column associated to that patch is still processed. Now I send to the second one. Then it's not really buffering. I, I'm still routing. It's just that since the first column is busy, I'm sending to the second one. And then when I get the third, first and second are busy. Oh, okay, so that, that's what's called a delay line memory, right? I mean, it's 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 the fact that, you know, you, something operating the thing and its results are gonna come later. And by the fact that it's some serial process, something can actually look at, you know, you know, uh, things from time one, time two, time three, and they get aggregated and you can do something off of that. So yeah, that, that would be a form of delayed memory, which is, I said, but you have to, you have to show that that is, that is uh, what's going on uh, there uh, against, you know, how much, you know, how much do we have in, at the cortical column, the notion of, of, uh, working memory or is that a uh, higher but, level concept? But I think, yeah, I think we got to keep in mind that would have to be local to the cortical column because each cortical column no, absolutely. has its, that's uh, what, that's its my separate point. field. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. You have you have to you have to show that mechanism, you know, kind of emerging out of whatever the structure is there. Uh, it, we're not, you know, killing it off one way or the other, but uh, it's got to be a mechanism there. Okay, just a very dumb question. It's one receptive field to one cortical column, or is it one receptive field to n cortical columns? Uh, each cortical column sees a subs a particular subset of the input field. Okay, but that and then the next cortical column will see could be an, a different but overlapping subset. Could be an overlapping subset, but okay. that's not the same as receptive field. That has a different meaning. I see, I see. You don't uh, have like, so that's this, right. the same receptive field associated with like 10 particle columns. That's not the case. What do you mean by receptive field? I think we could go with the idea here that a neuron has a receptive field and a cortical columns like receptive field would be like something uh, like the union of neuron level receptive fields. Does that hold water? Yeah, I was thinking about like- Yeah, so the receptive field is like the, the a, a, yeah, it's defined at the level of a neuron, like what does it respond to in the input? And so like a, a, you might have a, a neuron inside a cortical column that looks at a vertical, response to a vertical edge. Other neurons in the same cortical column might respond to horizontal edges or you know, diagonal edges or whatever. And so they're, but they would all be looking at the same visual area to determine whether it's a horizontal or. I see. Okay, yeah. let, let, me, let me phrase my question then. So a little patch of the eye, like a particular patch of the eye. Yeah. Is that associated with one cortical column? Yeah, primarily with one cortical column. Okay, okay. I was it, again, one. it's all, it, it's distributed, you know, the, the next one will be overlapping, but you can think of it as, as one. It, it's like a convolutional network, like one, you know, let's say you have a convolutional kernel that has a five by five kernel coming in and you have a stride of three, right? So any given part of the input is primarily going to one, but another cortical, another, you know, any given pixel is probably going to, let's say two different, it's being processed twice by this convolutional kernel. I see. It's, you can think of it that way. Okay. I don't yeah, know if that so, made it more confusing or not, but no, no, no. I um, think my whole my <laughs> whole uh, my whole line of thought here was based on my incorrect misunderstanding that one patch of the eye was associated with n cortical columns, but it's not. It's just associated with one. It, it's so, any yeah. given any given pixel could go to multiple cortical columns. Right, but it's yeah, but not too many. Yeah, yeah, I got it. At, at, at least depends on the global stride. primary input. At the level of primary input, if you consider that there's a hierarchy there going V1, V2, V3, and the recept the quote unquote receptive field then spans multiple inputs, it it does span that, but not within the one cortical column. I think is, is the, you're you're thinking of 
you know, the, the, the notion is, is that the direct primary input to the first level of cortical column is, is going to be segmented somewhat from, from the rest of them. But after that, you know, who knows how many things talk to each other? <laughs>